नाम तो देना चाहिए ना नाम वो भी क्योंकि उसका स्पेसिफिक कुछ रीजन होना चाहिए कि वो नाम क्यों है सूटेबल होना चाहिए सूटेबल होना चाहिए अभी हम लोगों को ये टाइगर का पूरा मतलब इसका थोड़ा नॉलेज हो गया है कि ये टाइगर इधर से इधर ऐसे ही घूमता रहता है तो दाफलंग टावर के आसपास ही इसका ज्यादा साइटिंग हो रहा है तो इसीलिए हमने ये इसका नाम दाफोली दे दिया दाफोली क्या हमेशा ऐसे वेट कर रहा है वन एंड हाफ आवर हो गया वेट कर रहे हैं अभी वो तो क्या बोलू मैं वो तो जंगल का रानी है दफोली डर के रुके हुए हैं क्या डियर सर बात मत करो देने लाइक एन ऑरेंज सुलेबल लेविटेटिंग ऑन इलेलिजिबल क्लाउड दैट इमेंस लाइट ड्रम थ्रू द डार्केनिंग एयर almost as if to announce that it's time for you outrageously civilized to go home allow those nocturnal beings to seize their deep hunger and like a seemingly healed wound that left behind its scars carby anglong hill against the backdrop of earth and sky's rich pool stood with wrinkled black screen as seen from daflang watchtower of kaziranga range during the afternoon safari oh yes once again i was in central zone Just few years ago it was almost a regularity to recover several cartridge shells of .303 rifle between Daflang and Borbil forest camps in Bagodi range onslaught by poaching gangs and tackled by forest guards couldn't possibly be peaceful the rigor to protect emblematic species is understandably high because this national park saved the indian one-horned rhinoceros literally from the brink of extinction And since then, Kaziranga dwarfed all other conservation efforts of neighboring states and countries in a saga that sounds almost like an obdurate romance with rhinoceros unicorns. A kind of exotism that can only be compared with story of inseparable oneness, pure, visceral, and dangerous.
but danger in a forest doesn't follow a script. I was seriously contemplating whether I should name this particular episode as O Tiger. But since uh, one horn rhino is the primary keystone species of Kazinanga, and as I have promised that I am going to showcase how Kazinanga revived its rhino population from near extinction in an unprecedented effort while the fight is still on. That's why I have zeroed down on this particular name. But this second safari experience was as much about rhino as it was as much about tiger and any other animal species. Uh, you know, a jungle for the most part is a very quiet place. And I have been to forests previously where kills happened. Tiger was hunting very close by. Uh, but those were Central Indian forest where prey species mostly spotted deer. Within half an hour, everything seemed to come back to normal. Here a mega herbivore, Kaziranga's rhino, was taken down. And that essentially shifted something inside the forest and shook the forest from inside. While every safari carries its singular flavor, if I am asked to pick one in terms of wholesome Kaziranga experience, I will choose this one in a hard bit. What an incredible roller coaster this has been. In my second wildlife safari, I have seen 11 Great Indian 100 rhinoceros, 30 plus elephants, and I'm quoting this number modestly because I might have seen the same elephant twice in multiple herds. Uh, four other species of mammals, four species of insects, one species of reptile, and 10 species of birds, out of which one of them I have seen in thousands. I kid you not, if jungle had its version of rock and roll, this was it. And that's because last night a rhino was killed and every animal as if was suffering some kind of identity crisis and power struggle uh, to signal their supremacy and claim their stakes on the land. And that's where you come in the picture because this has given me an unique opportunity to showcase different animal vocalizations. The savage dance between predator and prey for survival and how you can pick up the meanings of those different calls in order to give yourself just those extra edge in terms of tiger sighting in any Indian forest or just to read the forest in general. Because you cannot just leave everything on the guide and go with the flow if you want to position yourself for a better wildlife sighting. Uh, fortunately, my guide had been exceptional, but such guides are uh, very rare in any forest. Timestamps are provided below, but it's best not to skip any part if you want to completely understand the art of tracking and science of nature's marvel. Also, the great revelation leading to the end, something that can potentially change your perception of forest forever, will not make any sense at all if you do not see the proceedings as it is unfolded. But before getting inside the forest, let me tell you the love story behind Kaziranga, because that's what Kaziranga is all about, a savage love story. My guide, Mr. Pallav, turned around to look at me and shouted tiger after almost at the end to my second safari. My instant response was to reach where they were standing. I knew that it wasn't permissible to step out of the jeep for visitors except while walking in and around watchtowers with forest guard and only rangers, forest guides and guards can step out. But in that spur of the moment, I forgot all protocols and rules. Well, almost. And that's the position I hate. This almost, this neither here nor there middle ground of uninspiring prudence with pangs for totality. Long ago, two individuals though totally defied all societal rules and started a romance. A romance that perhaps inscribed their names permanently in this legendary forest sky. A forest guard told me that when Brahma's untamed son spreads its arms, Kazaranga comes alive with joy, like a child in its mother's arms. But I already told you that several stories flowed behind its name. According to one legend, a girl named Rangwa from a nearby village and a youth named Kazi from Karbiyanglong fell in love. This match was not acceptable to their families and the couple eloped and disappeared into the forest, never to be seen again and the forest was named after them. This story carries hint of an ethical consideration of interdependence and interconnectedness of human and non-human. In shaping our sense of accountability towards the wilderness, 
while revealing the potent power of finding splendid treasures of love in an untamed natural world, it also carries a hermetic, neo-romantic, and almost pessimistic never to be seen again undertone. As if either someone wants to propagate that vanishing into oblivion or living in anonymity would be the destiny if someone violates familial norms or something even more sinister might take place. Instead of seeing this forest and its intricate living wave of relationships from a cosmic perspective and returning to love all the more passionately with this creation, I felt that this story wanted to pass on some unfounded fear. Now, of course, there are several ways to look at it, just like there's many different aspects and angles to the Rhino Resurrection success story of Kaziranga. As soon as I entered the forest in afternoon, I felt a different vibration. While in the morning, Kaziranga often appeared in sleepy stupor, now it felt a buzz. One, two, three, na? So, yahan se gaya hai. Remember that barely visible solo tall bird hiding behind the heart of hog deer during morning safari? That large wedding bird of stock family decided to make its presence felt this time while resting on a close porch. We just entered on the alluvial inundated grassland of Kaziranga and saw them. These birds are generally solitary except when breeding during which they will form loose nesting colonies as I could see in the form of few ground dwellers. <laughs> They were named adjutant by British colonial troops based on their slow and stiff military gait and their habit of standing motionless for a long period of time, reminiscent of officers or adjutants standing at attention. Males and females look alike except males tend to be larger in size and heavier build. Lesser adjutants are believed to be monogamous, however they may not always pair for life. At the onset of the breeding season, they congregate at nesting areas in suitable wetlands to form small loose colonies, sometimes including other large water birds such as pelicans, and several of them will build their nest in the canopy of one single tall broad-limbed trees with sparse foliage. 
Due to similar appearance traits, many think rhinos as a modern version of, if not the last living dinosaur. But actually rhinos got nothing to do with them and rather these warm-blooded vertebrates are much more closer to dinosaur. Modern birds descended from a group of two-legged dinosaurs known as theropods whose members include the towering Tyrannosaurus rex. Wonder how different Kaziranga look like from today when the Viceroy of India, Mary Curzon, who held the highest official title in the Indian Empire that a woman could hold as the wife of Lord Curzon of Kedleston, operating then as the Viceroy of India, visited this forest during 1904. Mary Curzon heard about rhinos from her British tea planter friends and came to Assam with hopes to spot the big mammal. Although she could not see the animal, she spotted hoof prints with three toes and believed that such a peculiar animal did exist. She persuaded Lord Curzon to do something about it, to protect the species from total annihilation, and thus the wills of British bureaucracy started rolling. After a series of meetings and documentations, the Kaziranga proposed reserve forest was created with an area of 232 square kilometer in 1905. <laughs> It had to be maidens or rhino dung because pink spider flowers were around. Why so? To know about it, watch the episode 1 after finishing this if you haven't yet. After quite a bit of undulating ride, suddenly my guide stopped the jeep. Most of them were quite far, yes there was more than one, and I was struggling to hold my camera steady in maximum zoom. Try to reduce camera shake as much as I could for this special moment. It was raining rhinos for us. And unlike most YouTube videos, I don't have Mary Curzon or her powerful husband to thank for this because the reality is quite different and complex. Seven rhinos in the same place on Kaziranga grassland is an absolute privilege. More so considering that not too far ago, their population was almost wiped out. Actually, British destroyed rhinos in Asia. So amidst pressure, they felt the need to do something simultaneously when rhinos didn't oblige to the royal visit. In the 19th century, these animals were protected by the Rana rulers 
but individuals could be shot with a permit from the Maharaja or the Prime Minister. Later, during 1905 till 1939, ridiculously large number of rhinoceros were hunted down by the British royal family along the Himalayan foothill region known as the Terai. If this keystone species were to go extinct, which became a real possibility, it could negatively impact the entire ecosystem and create imbalance. But it's not just imbecile royal arrogance. Something else started happening with alarming regularity, making locals initially frozen in disbelief and anger. Now this 430 square kilometer area is delightfully sprinkled with elephant grass meadows, swampy lagoons and dense forest. But perhaps what evokes most awe and wonder about Kaziranga under a global lens is the fact that it is now home to more than 2,613 iconic Indian Vanahan rhinoceros, of which 1,700 are adults. But meanwhile, something else happened with us inside the forest, which made all visitors present in that spot frozen in awe and suspense. <laughs> Jungle shakes with the sound of what I have been told. My body got instantly stiff. When I was busy with the lesser adjutant stock, most jeeps crossed us and they were waiting here. Our jeep was the only one in that spot when we saw so many rhinos. And my guide, Mr. Pallab, told me that they were waiting because they heard alarm call. He also faintly heard the call once. I didn't. I will come back to rhino but right now the mood was claimed by the only one animal who could deflect Kaziranga's otherwise single-minded attention from its rhinos. But then, nature follows its own rhythm, and so I couldn't only focus on tiger or alarm call upon arriving at this spot. For the next one and a half hour or so, whatever unfolded here will remain forever etched in my memory, and I actually hold it even higher than tiger sighting in wild. If you think that the basic concept of AI got germinated inside an MIT lab, then I got some news for you. But what about the news that's bothering me since morning? Did the fully really alone kill a rhino? Pick up any wildlife journal and in almost all probability all of them will tell you that it's just not realistically possible. Just like they are going to tell you that you should always wear neutral khaki or green color to blend inside a forest while I was wearing bright orange t-shirt inside a gray sweater. Why is it so? Well, while I'm going to make a separate video on best safari wear, the fact is that it depends from forest to forest. For example, in Central and East Africa, you should not wear uh, dark blue or uh, black color in safari because it can attract nasty bite from a certain fly. But camouflage clothing is not necessarily ideal for all forests.
There are very few things one experiences in life which can't be expressed in words. I can easily narrate how finding a tiger or lion in wild feels like, but this made me look beyond the horizon. Perhaps Kazi and Rangwa found liberation in the light of the same sky I was watching, and they transcended the need to return to civilization after taking flight with such symphony of nature. Perhaps they tried to follow the norms, but decided to consciously embrace the beautiful danger of life as they couldn't fit in like that solitary starling. Marmorations form about an hour before sunset in fall, winter and early spring when the birds are near where they will sleep. This happened throughout art, but I have shown you all at once for capturing the pattern and that's why you are time traveling and the sky became lighter again. You are now seeing what I saw after half an hour upon reaching here. Scientists think a marmoration is a visual invitation to attract other starlings to join a group night roost. One theory is that spending the night together keeps the starlings warmer as they share their body heat. It might also reduce the chance an individual bird would be eaten overnight by a predator such as owl. The more starlings in the flock, the lower the risk to any one bird of being the one that gets snacked by predator. As individual birds try to move towards the safer middle of the crowd in a phenomenon known as selfish heart effect, predators like hawk or eagle get confused and distracted by the tricky wave patterns as it's hard to focus on a single target from a swirling gigantic mass flight. As you can see, Fear of predators evoke many different behavioral displays for all animals. Biologists, mathematicians, physicists, computer scientists, and engineers are all working to figure out how animals carry out these brilliantly coordinated displays without colliding. They consider marmorations as one of the most dazzling, shape-shifting, and mysterious displays in the natural world, and the complete picture is still unknown. Kaziranga has at least seven types of sterlings. And right now they kept everyone enthralled, so much so that at least I almost forgot about Tiger for quite some time. Well, almost. Somebody was out on the road to our left, quite far from where the jeeps were. Body language overall relaxed but slightly uncertain. We did not go that direction as we didn't want to disturb any ongoing activity. We were still not totally sure where the call exactly came from. Did this male make the call? We saw that the deer was moving away from us further. After some time, a female was seen behind the bush, pretty close to where we were and looked like she was trying to intently hear something with her satellite-like ears. And finally, we found the source of the call. All deer, some bird deer's warning or alarm calls are most accurate when it comes to tracking tigers. 
If somber deer calls twice in succession, it means it's certainty that a tiger is somewhere very near. Tracking predators in Indian national parks require a lot of experience, but the jungle has its own tiger alarm mechanism. It is often your knowledge of understanding different alarm calls that determines your chances of tiger sighting during a safari because your subject is a lone master of disguise. If you are a first timer or greenhorn inside the forest, you will be surprised to see that how drivers and guides change sudden direction of jeep in 180 degrees after hearing alarm call and their experience tells them where to go. Like pug marks, scratch marks, spray, droppings and growls, alarm calls are direct signs that danger is moving or near. But finding footprints and signs of activity will usually tell you what's happened on last night's hunt if you are experienced enough. Once the animal vanishes into the tangled undergrowth, the only way, however, is to track is to stand and listen for a call. These warnings are basically anti-predator adaptation signals emitted by social animals in response to danger and somewhat different from parsu deterrent signals. Now what's that? Not for once make the mistake of thinking that in a forest, only the predators are be-all and end-all mighty animals. Actually, predators and prey engage in a fascinating behavioral exchange, almost like a coordinated dance for ecological balance and evolutionary benefits. You can think of pursuit deterrent signal as a form of perception advertisement, wherein prey species by vocal signaling tells the predator that, hey tiger or lion, don't unnecessarily waste time and effort by running after me as I have already spotted you. I am fit enough to escape. I have already established how smart I am because I can see you. And if you can do some math, please check that it's a stupid strategy to come after me as your chances of killing me is very low. So this is how, when encountering predators, prey animals often expose themselves by loud vocalization, by repeated movements or by revealing conspicuous colors. Many think that deer and other prey species attempt to hide up on spotting tiger. But unless they are consciously going for camouflage self-defense strategy, they rather often reveal themselves more and that's how we get to know some activity is on. Now the more elaborate displays were often considered to be warning signals directed to other prey and the less obvious displays are intention movements but both are behavioral signals. So in a forest, if I have to give you one tip for tiger sighting, I will tell you that close your eyes and open your ears. And in this matter, others' patience and impatience both can be infectious. That's why I hired Solo Jeep for every safari even though I can greatly reduce my cost by sharing because it's critical to visit forests with people having similar temperament towards wildlife for a fulfilling experience. We are so much surrounded by constant source of stimuli in our regular life that it's difficult for us these days to stand or sit patiently at a spot for hours without making noise or fidgeting with gadgets. All this overexposure dumbed down our senses over the time. And you will understand that in a forest, if you immerse yourself in its sights, sounds and smells. But then we are an incredible animal species. The human eye can detect the equivalent of a single candle flame burning 30 miles away and can distinguish among three lakh different colors. can detect sounds as low as 20 hertz and the tick of a clock about 20 feet away in a quiet room. So why couldn't I see or hear a tiger if he was anywhere near? Actually, even if he was moving somewhere close, we might not be able to figure. 
It's a big area and as you have seen many times by now, Kaziranga has tall elephant grasses growing as tall as 12 feet. This provides the perfect stealth and camouflage tigers bank on. They seem to love hiding in these grasses and rarely expose themselves outside. If they are out in the meadows during safari time, then they offer good sighting chances. But then, multiple calls were heard around this location. That's why still few jeeps were rushing to this spot, even though most of them have left, dejected by now. All of us present here knew that a tiger was lurking close by, and none of us could see even a glimpse. Or could it be, no, no, we are quite far from the flung watchtower. I dismissed my own stupid thought. Still, I asked my guide, which tiger owns this territory? Mr. Pallav said that there are two males around and it could be any of them. But they are typically shy and don't come out usually when jeeps wait on the track. You can mostly see them if you find them in open meadows, he added. When all movements and alarm calls doused down, I asked him, if those males don't usually come out when jeeps are around, why we are still waiting? Let's move now. With a tone of mild disagreement, he said, let's wait for some more time, because the folly comes here too. What? Tigers have territory ranges greater than those of tigresses, that is those of males are up to three times larger than those of females. So how come a tigress is entering male territory? I asked. I got to know that in Kaziranga, typically the territory of a male overlaps with that of one to three tigresses. Also, it was documented that Dafoli enters male territory and challenges all dominant male tigers in this area. Now isn't that unfair? Tigers' favorite and primary prey can't even see them clearly because they cannot readily tell apart red and green hues. They would see reds and oranges as shades of green. Now that's a terrifying prospect when your predator can go completely unnoticed against green vegetation. Even with three types of color receptors and much sharper eyesight than the dichromat deer, we were unable to spot the tiger or tigress even though we knew some movement happened close by. And that's also because someone let us know thanks to their excellent sense of smell and hearing. Frankly, I was disappointed to not get the sighting here as there was a real window of opportunity. I didn't have much hope to see the foley during the morning safari when we waited for over two hours in front of her favorite corridor. But here the jungle appeared dressed up for some action. I still didn't know that another chance, even better, would open up during this afternoon adventure. Except one more jeep, rest left this spot. So here comes my second tip. If a real tiger sighting chance gets created and many jeeps wait in a queue like here, don't immediately leave the spot if the warning calls stop and forest appears very dull. Because there could be a possibility that when most of the jeeps leave and disturbances become minimal, tiger might feel comfortable enough to come out from the bush. I also expressed my intent of leaving once before. Mostly because my patience was running thin as I hardly got any rest in between safaris and I was running temperature. I returned to the resort around 12 pm after the morning safari and Mr. Pallab came to pick me up again at 1.30 pm. So I barely got any time to rest while putting all my photography kits in charge and finishing lunch. Oh yes, back to back safari especially when one person is recording the proceedings with heavy camera was really tough. It looks all hunky-dory in a video, but the reality is, this may not be an ideal vacation time for most. A lot of thought went into making this video, and even the template or font color is not random here. This time I have changed not only the lighting, but also the background, and I was trying to make this point that while you may notice, a deer or a wild boar will not. Typically, they say that we are green inside the forest to blend in with the surroundings. 
but now you know why I was wearing bright orange. Apart from old world primates, all animals including tigers got dichromatic vision and that means orange is as good as green for them. Now you also know why I have written the folly in green. After all, to get inside the mind of the predator, you need to know its prey species. While looking for the stone chat, I shrugged and told myself, so what? Instead of a carnivore, let's enjoy this insectivore. While I'm very much into birding, I was struggling to keep my spirits up as I was quite unwell. And this is where credit goes to my guide, as without his insistence and amazing patience, I would have missed experiencing what wildlife lovers' dreams are made of. And uh, moreover, as much as I wanted to see the tiger, a part of me was also bothered because too many deer were around, including the fawns. <laughs> Tracking is a huge game of patience, and unless you experience random happy serendipity, like once happened with me in Kabini, where within 10 minutes of afternoon safari, I saw a tiger, it's painstakingly tough to meet the royalty. I told you, tiger may not come out if they sense the presence of something they are not huge fan of. Mr. Palla barely moved the jeep forward from the spot and sensed elephant herd ahead. I was thinking that he was so much enamored by the folly that he didn't want to leave till it made no sense to wait. But then I realized why this young birder from Northeast is a class apart. He was waiting for the reason why alarm calls stopped suddenly. Sometimes, in a jungle, the king or queen gives way to the titan. I felt rejuvenated to see her. Elephants orchestrate the jungle's ecosystem like none other. World's heaviest horticulturist, they eat abundant amount of fruits and when seeds are expelled through their guts, in right condition, a new plant is formed. Only about 5% of the species' original habitat remains and even this is fragmented by highways, railway lines, canals, reservoirs, tourism infrastructure and power transmission lines. We realized that she wasn't alone there. If you were startled now, so was I. Another two jeeps came from the back and joined us here and one woman expressed her amazement list concern so loudly that my camera mic clearly picked it up. Even though you understand her heartfelt emotions, it's better not to make such noise, particularly in front of large mammals with cubs, to ensure safety of all onlookers. Just like human mothers, elephant moms are very protective of their cubs too, if not more. Angry elephants easily charge towards tigers and lions to safeguard babies. We often think of animals as being fiercely independent, yet many species have incredibly strong parental instincts that drive them to protect their family and young ones.
Well, it was mega hard before fair. Two iconic species in the single frame, with the Tasker expressing his dominance, juxtaposed with six one-hot rhinos in the background, dispelled all my fatigue as Mr. Palla moved the jeep a little more from those initial elephant herds with Cub. As they were moving towards the water body, he estimated that they were going to join a bigger group. When he whispered, "Agar hamara luck click kiya to aaj June mein milenge," I didn't realize the enormity he was talking about. Even though many get aggressive towards elephants as they destroy corpses, creating huge economic loss, but that's an aspect of man-animal conflict. And overall, I have seen uneducated or less educated villagers behaving themselves better in presence of wild. And when those people once in a blue moon visit an urban shopping mall or in a remotely upmarket setup. I have seen them being at the receiving end of snobbish, if not downright persecutory looks. I wish nature had a reverse mirror to hold. In all probability, the sight of which repelled the tiger, a well-dressed man was even whistling at them, talking about noise, trumpeting repeatedly as you have heard the tusker doing was a do not disturb signal. So they were already agitated. But here an adult was giggling and screaming while vlogging. and then a jeep started engine while elephants were crossing i didn't get angry with the concerned mother but here i tried hard to swallow my displeasure educated people lacking basic sensibility is dangerously on the rise this country celebrates the moving tale of two orphaned elephants raised by poor caretakers once it gets recognized by oscars but the real attitude and treatment towards animals leave much to be desired Leaving this otherwise euphoric memory behind, we proceeded towards the Aflang Watchtower. We all lost count of how many elephants we saw. Mr. Pallab lightheartedly said, "Now, if you see a tiger, your Kaziranga safari is over." I knew it could never be over unless we at least attempt to visit the only zone where there is some remote possibility of witnessing the rarest and only ape found in Indian wild. But indeed, the sighting so far in Kaziranga has exceeded my expectations. Till then, I knew that I got another two safaris lined up, and then I should be at Pobitora. That's why I have booked his service till tomorrow. Ultimately, I ended up doing two more safaris here. This guide from another jeep asked whether elephants could be seen now. The visitors of this jeep missed so many elephants and rhinos as they left the spot once alarm call stopped. 
Looking at his facial expression, it didn't feel like they saw anything special near the flung area either. But you never know, I have seen so many visitors with a sullen expression unless they see a tiger. I have explained about this mega species myopia in my last video on endangered animals. No doubt spotting big mammals is exhilarating, but that's not what this entire forest experience is all about. Come to think of it, if in this health I wouldn't have seen anything else other than two common species of birds today, as it has happened with me many times before, I too would have felt low, so I totally get it. In many Indian forests, guides only attempt towards tiger sighting on guest request. They don't even wait and put effort towards anything else. For elephants, they say, if they show up, they show up. Here at least rhinos are there to compete for interest. Many of you may be surprised to know that rhinos descended from hoofed animals and their closest living relatives are tapirs, horses and zebras. They are known as odd-toed ungulates. It means basically they walk on three toes. Rhinos have three toes on each foot, so in a way their tracks resemble the ace of clubs. It's different from evolution of horses and zebras' feet, even though they share genetic proximity. But what's even more surprising is that when the first rhinos evolved, they were about the size of an average dog and grew into animals about the size of horses and then animals twice as large as a bull African elephant before reducing in size somewhat to the animals we know and can see today. An international research team has found fossils in India that appear to point to the common ancestor of all living or toad ungulates. They found the fossils of a creature known as Cambotherium DVC. Over the course of the past decade, they dug up more than 200 Cambotherium bones, including teeth, vertebrae and foot bones, in an open pit coal mine in India's Gujarat state. When Cambodian walked the earth about 54.5 million years ago, India was a huge island drifting between Madagascar and Asia. How did it get there? The researchers can't say for sure. The greater one-horned rhino is one of the largest species on earth, weighing in at 2.2 tons. When I spotted this animal in morning safari, that was not my first close encounter with rhino. I had experienced excellent sighting before too in Jaldapara and Gurumara National Parks of West Bengal. Just that I didn't used to make videos those days. The historical range of the greater one horned rhinoceros extended along the flood plains of the Ganges, Brahmaputra and Sindh rivers from Pakistan to the Indo-Burma border. The species is now restricted, however, to nine populations in protected areas in India and Nepal. With the exception of the populations in Chitwan in Nepal, Kaziranga and Jaldapara Wildlife Sanctuary in India, the populations of each site is less than 150 individuals. Assam is home to the largest population of them with nearly 85% of global population of 100 rhinos concentrated here, of which Kaziranga alone contains 70%. There were just a handful of Indian one-horned rhinoceros left when the park was set up a century ago. Royal hunters and then poachers made it abundantly clear that rhinos need utmost protection. Why poachers target their horn though? Rhino horn can fetch very high prices in Vietnam and China, where it is sold as a miracle cure for everything from cancer to erectile dysfunction. Indian rhinos have smaller horns than those of African rhinos, but reportedly they are marketed as being far more potent. Street vendors charge as much as $6,000 for 100 drum, making it considerably more expensive than gold. But how far should we go to protect these endangered animals? The 
the half-poached soul of Kaziranga perhaps screamed as far as one can. And so Kaziranga Rangers have been given the kind of powers to shoot and kill, normally only conferred on armed forces policing civil unrest. The instruction was clear, see a poacher or any outsider at night inside the park, shoot, no question asked, combat fire with fire. The government has granted guards like Mr. Manik extraordinary powers that give them considerable protection against prosecution if they shoot and kill people in the park. Though all national parks in India got anti-poaching campaigns and armed forces set up, this was an unprecedented tough move by the then government as it has been criticized as extrajudicial executions and sometimes innocent villagers, mostly tribal people, have been caught up in the conflict. Mr. Manek said that the term shoot on sight does not accurately describe how the forest rangers deal with suspected poachers. He insisted that at least one warning was always given, if possible. Rangers try to arrest them for investigation, but if those options don't work out, then... Obviously, human rights activists got furious, considering that many dead were unidentified and lacked proper documentation like magisterial inquiry, the forensic report and the post-mortem reports. Poaching gangs recruit local people to help them get into the park, but the actual shooters, the men who kill the rhinos, tend to come from neighboring states. Local community have been lured into the trade as rhino horn prices have risen exponentially and the park defended their stance of deadly shootouts to save rhino. So much so that when BBC filmed a documentary called One World Killing for Conservation, exposing those alleged shootouts without proper investigation, the Ministry of Environment and Forest and Climate Change has urged the Ministry of External Affairs to revoke the visas of BBC's crew and ban their entry into India for at least five years. They may expose this dark secret as much as they want, but the Park Authority dismissed it as grossly erroneous reporting. It's true that the forest guards were given legal immunity in Kazadanga and Corbett to use lethal force to stop poaching and there is no denying that firepower is required to take on heavily armed poachers. But concerns about guards' responsible use of power is justified too. There have been instances when guards allegedly settled personal scores with locals in the name of anti-poaching operations. So foolproof or human method to save rhino? Definitely not. But effective? The numbers say... Heck yes. Cool. While my nerves were supercharged when we reached the flung and hardened an alarm call, I still didn't know the kind of thrill that was awaiting us. Did I see a tiger? You have to see the rest of the video to find it out. But what's the next best thing apart from watching an animal in the wild and working towards its conservation? Perhaps it is to appreciate their painting. And this is where I would like to take the opportunity to present the work of my friend, Shukon Napal, who, just like me, is trying to explore her creativity while balancing with her full-time work.
personal favorites are this one and this one. It's already on the wall. And uh, I have provided her Instagram handle as well as her website link in the description. So do check out her work and support small individual enterprise. They are reasonably priced, uh, customizable and typically she has very quick turnaround time. No, there's no discount code called the Foley. But yeah, if you place bulk order, who knows, I may nudge her uh, to provide some discount for my audience. Let's go back to see what happened in the flung. Now you're in trouble. You're going to tell me the time is there. <laughs> no. <laughs> Just now we've had one alarm call, but that's it. After that dead silence. <laughs> I think it can be a false call as well. But for a minute or two, there were a bunch of hog deers. They got all got startled actually. Um, the entire pack got startled, so not sure. But there was a proper alarm call. So nothing up to that. One Hungarian wildlife photographer was present at this watchtower. I got to know that this was his 22nd safari in Kaziranga and he has seen tiger only three times and he was sharing his amusement at how difficult it is to find tigers here. As soon as we stepped inside the flung watchtower, we heard an alarm call, this time by hog deer. They also raised their tail in presence of danger as we have already seen, but unlike some bird, hog deer disperse and emit a whistling call or a bark of warning. The bright tail flash appear confusing for the predator and just give hog deer those extra few seconds to escape and then they drop their tails when running which make it difficult to track them further. Some bird usually stands tall till the predator is very close, making them more vulnerable target. But I would rely on a some bird's call any day more than any other deer species. Dafolang Tower is Dafoli's territory, so well-fed Dafoli after last night's rhino kill couldn't be possibly moving so much that she went to the previous spot, saw a huge herd of elephants and came back to Daflang again within this time frame, I surmised. It must be a different tiger there or this could be a false alarm. Alarm behaviors without genuine threat appear surprisingly frequent across a range of taxa including insects, amphibians, fish, mammals and birds. In some bird flocks, false alarms have been recorded to substantially outnumber true alarms. False alarms can be costly in terms of both the energetic cost of producing alarm behaviors as well as lost opportunity cost because other alerted members might be busy in hunting, eating or resting. But lower light levels in the afternoon can make an individual hog deer misclassify stimuli and produce a false alarm. Tiger is coming? Tiger is coming here, right? How many tigers are here? Tiger is a lot. Yes? Yes. 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 Third suggestion, don't decide your next route or form any opinion based on hearsay unless it is coming from an experienced and knowledgeable resource. We left the watchtower soon after and came to the place which according to my guide is the hotspot. My idea in the first safari was to enjoy the serenity of nature without any agenda. But then last night something happened in this jungle something not so regular that shook my plan halfway. We already spent considerable time here in the morning in front of Dafuli's favorite corridor, the tigress who killed the rhino presumably, the tigress about whom Mr. Pallab talks about in a way that it feels like she is less of a tigress, more of an enchantress. I saw her glimpses in his mobile, but it totally didn't sink in yet why his eyes catch a quick sparkle every time he talks about her, even though as a guide regularly he was conducting jeep safaris, and Dafoli crossed his path quite a few times. I was certainly very thrilled as engaged guide like him are hard to come by, but still I wondered why, what's so special about her? 
And frankly, I couldn't digest till then that a tiger or tigress could kill a rhino even though they definitely could hurt each other out of an intense clash. We weren't even talking about a rhino cub and so I got solid reason for my apprehension. Even though I knew that animal behaviors are hard to predict and not everything is well documented. So even guides also at times rely on word of the mouth hypothesis. I'm going to make a separate video with detailed strength comparison between tiger and rhino. How unlikely an event this could be if it were true, I thought. अच्छा <laughs> कि हम लोग ये टाइगर कौन सा है वो टाइगर कौन सा है स्ट्राइक देख के पहचाना है ऐसा था नाथ हां तो अभी हम लोगों के पास थोड़ा थोड़ा कैमरा ये सब होने लगा है तो हम लोग अभी टाइगर का स्ट्राइक देख के उसको आइडेंटिफाई कर सकते हैं कि ये टाइगर कहां है मतलब यही वाला टाइगर है या अलग टाइगर है तो अभी जो मान लीजिए हम लोगों को डाफलांग में जो टाइगर दिखा वो टाइगर और यहां में जो दिखा था टाइगर वो सेम है तो हम लोगों ने इसीलिए उसको ऐसे ट्रेस किया है कि वो इस तरह से ऐसे आता है और इसीलिए हम लोगों ने उसका नाम दिया है हां ये फॉरेस्ट रेंज ऑफिसर का कार्य है क्या तो पहले क्या होता था फॉरेस्ट वालों को पता होता था कि वो तो कैमरा चेक करता था पहले हां कैमरा सबसे हां तो उन लोगों को तो पता ही होता था कि ये टाइगर कहां है हां ये टाइगर ये वाला है ये वाला ये अलग-अलग टाइगर उन लोगों का नंबरिंग होता ही था हम्म लेकिन वो पब्लिक नहीं करता था हम्म ये ये हम लोग को गिनती में 1.121 टाइगर है मगर हम 120 बोलते हैं तो हम लोग को नंबरिंग है मतलब his affable face instantly changed and he gave me a look as if I were doubting the ability of someone of his own or his information. But my probe made him eventually contemplate about the possibility that the rhino was already injured or sick before the attack. One of the strongest animals on earth, with a nearly a 2,200 kilogram body, 8 to 24 inch horn that can significantly damage any incoming predator, and running speeds of nearly 40 to 50 km per hour, rhinos can come dashing like a living tank into any animal with a strike force that exceeds 8,000 pounds per square inch. As much as I was aware, almost no predator, including a lion or tiger's claws, can pierce through most part of their body with armor-like skin. The tigers, like other big cats, possess a very thick skin. It is no match for the rhinos who have one of the thickest skins in the world. A male one-horned rhino in his prime is out of question for any Royal Bengal tiger in his or her prime. It was a fresh kill and Dafoli was seen eating the carcass at night. That's it. So nobody yet knew much about exactly what transpired, which rhino died, till forest officials recovered the footage from trap cameras. And in absence of proper information, which is very common in forest, human imagination tend to spin myth at times. However, both of them told me that instances of interspecies fight wasn't new here and showed me a photograph of a previous encounter, which I am using it in my video under fair use protocol with their permission. Last night flashed before my eyes and I didn't know what to say. This photograph is of a tiger who according to them similarly killed a rhino few years ago. Sensational? Yes. Did it divulge a clear story? No. Did it convey without any doubt that the apex predator alone was responsible for this? No. I wasn't disbelieving them at all because they knew this forest and its animals closely.
I wanted to know how this could be possible and I wasn't getting any satisfying answer. Mr. Manik said that Rhino would win over any tiger under normal circumstances, but there have been rare few incidents here in which specific male and the fully among female tigers got better of them when the natural setups were very much against the Rhino. I tried to imagine that last night the fully must have got one such unusually favorable moment, but even if the target were a sick female, it was quite unthinkable. However, I realized that they were certain that the tigress alone mortally wounded a rhino based on Mr. Manik's confirmed news from forest office and Mr. Pallab's I know what the fully is capable of stance. बाकी सब ए, मतलब एनिमल उसका फायदा उठाता है नॉट टाइगर इज ओनली टाइगर तो वो खा के वो चला जाएगा किल किल के पास नहीं रहेगा वो चला जाएगा दूर में तो तभी बाकी जो चिड़िया होता है ट्री पाए आता है सुअर आता है तो ये सब खाता है लेजर्ड आ जाता है मोनिटर लेजर्ड अभी थोड़ा बुरा हो गया इसलिए छोड़ दिया मैंने थोड़ा तकलीफ भी है ना इसमें वो बटल कैमरा सब ये करना पड़ता है ना यहाँ आपको कजरंग कैमरा लगते हैं आपको 662 स्क्वायर किलोमीटर में कैमरा होते हैं अच्छा बाकी जितना है वो तो नाइन हंड्रेड एट्टी सिक्स स्क्वायर किलोमीटर टोटल एरिया है इसका सब में कैमरा नहीं लगता जो बाफर जोन होते हैं बाफर जोन में कैमरा नहीं है इन्होंने पहले जो रिसर्च ऑफिसर हम लोगों का यहाँ का था तो उनके साथ में काम किया था तो इसलिए इनका टाइगर से थोड़ा नॉलेज जो है वो थोड़ा ज़्यादा है इसका इनका इन्होंने बहुत सारे ट्रैप कैमराज लगाया था तो कहाँ कहाँ टाइगर कहाँ कहाँ मूवमेंट करता है इनको पता ही था और ये टूरिस्ट रूट में भी घूमता है तो इनको इधर का भी टाइगर का बहुत पता होता है देखते हैं अभी क्या होता है द जंगल सडनली बिकेम अलाइव विथ प्लेंटी ऑफ बर्ड कॉल्स एंड नेक्स्ट यू नो वॉट हैपन्ड वी हार्ड अ रेंज ऑफ हाउलिंग एंड बार्किंग कॉल्स ऑफ जैकल्स लिटल अड एंड वी क्रॉस द फुल इज फेवरेट कॉरिडोर टू रीच द स्पॉट वेर वी मेड द ट्राइब out to get some share of the rhino remains perhaps lying at the grassland i anyway had a feeling that the fully wasn't around nearby and this clearly established so If you are thinking what's going on for a minute or two even I wasn't sure what's up Mr Pallab suddenly turned the jeep and pressed the accelerator pedal while I was still observing and recording the jackals no question asked no word spoken there wasn't any alarm call and so I knew this could happen only under one condition somebody alerted him of tiger movement somewhere else with the folly i was eager to meet whoever it might be it didn't make any sense to be hung up on one tigress in a jungle with a huge core area of nearly 500 square kilometer more so when it comes to this specific landscape with a limited number of safaris so give me a king or prince or princess or just a feline friend with whom i share 90% of homologous genes and i will take it gladly not necessarily it has to be the queen of kaziranga i whispered to the forest sky 
Mr. Pallab on the way reinforced my hope by saying that another guide messaged him. Just two words. Mohor, out. Enough to communicate that the apex predator was out near Mohor Bill. I was experiencing severe muscle pain while he was driving the jeep very fast on uneven trail. But I was quiet as I knew otherwise we would miss the sighting. I got to know visitors of two jeeps already saw the tiger. It's not the folly. A subadult male has been seen moving near the water body for less than a minute. <laughs> I was using my telephoto lens just as a telescope. Many jeeps by this time arrived here and guides were mostly on the ground, trying to spot the tiger who was sitting in front of the bush, an angle that was totally blocked for us from the jeep. Will my incredible sighting spray in this afternoon safari dub off for one final hurrah? I wondered. Few members of this hawk deer group were keeping an watch to the direction as their terror was apparently hiding behind those dense bush. With so many deer around once again here, the situation was ripe for some action. However, tigers are truly economical in killing their prey. Experienced ones don't attempt a move unnecessarily or unwittingly, and while strike rate depends on several factors including the skill of the individual, tigers are successful in their hunts roughly during 10 to 15% of their chase only, and on an average make a proper kill once in a week. It's another test of patience and now we were running against time. The tiger had to get up and show up within the next 15 minutes for us to be able to see as safari time was nearing close. And I was losing hope fast as the spot attracted plenty of disturbance and human noise already. Experts recommend to be breathless if possible when tiger is around. And here we managed to make a small flea market atmosphere. <laughs> You could imagine my state when my guide shouted tiger. Even though I felt so tempted, I didn't leap out from the jeep and instead stood on the seat to get a better view. But as soon as I climbed up, he gestured me to stop. His hand movement made it clear that the tiger moved for a flash second and then again vanished inside. Mr. Pallab had barely seen stripes inside the bush through binocular and I started accepting one more almost. A heavy sigh relaxed my breath. Next morning, I had plans to visit a different zone. Maybe I will have my royal encounter there, even the density is lesser in comparison. Maybe central zone will not gift me with the tiger sighting. But then it has already gifted me so much, so no complaints at all. My stream of thoughts got interrupted when Mr. Pallab smiled at me sportingly and came back to the jeep to say, these close chances, such waits for that one glimpse, make it worthwhile experience. Once you see, it's over. But these moments make a jungle so thrilling. While keeping my eyes on the possible prize, as I haven't totally yet given up, I continued my rumination with him by saying, Look, this place is pretty close to the first spot where we waited and heard so many summer alarm calls. So I think the same subadult male went there and came back here after encountering big elephant herd. And either Dafoli was somewhere resting near the Daflang tower and Hogdeer produced one bonding while she briefly got up or it was a false call. What say? Mr. Pallab shook his head with a slight hesitation as if he was thinking whether to say something out loud or not. He finally mumbled, Have you noticed how few Samba raised tails in alert in that spot and how others were roaming around plain confused? Do you remember that when you said Samba call, I told you that I wasn't sure about it? Yes, but we saw Samba calling there, right? 
you saw we all did mr pallab had a smirk on his face when he added yes we saw but that was slightly after those fast few calls i wasn't sure what he was trying to insinuate and i was getting restless few minutes to go before we needed to move towards the exit here the tiger wasn't out and my guide was speaking in riddles it took me quite a while to process what he said next somebody actually gave calls after a while i think the initial call when our jeep reached there and the ones immediately after my modulation started forming well i don't think somebody there was making those calls what are you saying we saw that somebody there came out immediately after the call on the road and then we also saw that specific deer while producing the call i'm sure they are not by hog deer but i am not sure what you are getting at i replied mr pallav realized i wasn't getting his hints at all and decided to lay it out for me do you know about cooking no cooking is an interesting vocalization but the tiger imitates the alarm call of the samba deer tiger's pook this is a hunting by mimicry technique where tigers make a sound mimicking the alarm call of samba deer the pook lures the deer towards the trap so the tiger can ambush it not for nothing they are the shyest yet shrewdest animal very few animals are able to deploy this advanced hunting strategy making tigers one of the most effective predators alive today and despite little recorded evidence of the phenomenon i think a tiger there was imitating samba calls initially which confused the deer herd and that's why we saw a samba coming out immediately after call with normal tail position but confused body language that's why deer in that spot were looking initially more inquisitive than alarmed because they were in two minds regarding whether there was in a real danger around finally one samba deer was able to differentiate that it was not a call made by one of their own and so he made a guttural squeak sound post which the real fear triggered and i had a feeling that it's the folly much before i told you that she occasionally visits that territory too it's because i have seen only her employing this strategy in this zone my best guess is that she sat quietly inside the bush all along while elephants were out didn't return to daflang but while we reached the watchtower she started moving towards the direction deer who was looking at the direction of bush might have picked up the scent called once but since she was still quite far from the tower mostly they were relaxed and settled down i was sitting speechless and i didn't know what to think i knew that beluga whales and dolphins learn hundreds of new vocalizations throughout their lives and orangutans and even elephants have been recorded appearing to imitate human speech i heard about the lyre bird native to australia one of the world's rarest of animals that can perfectly impersonate many different noises including car alarms and human voices but i didn't know about tiger's pooking strategy if his suppositions were true why the fool would pook after killing a rhino last night so many unanswered questions were haunting my mind when the safari ended and i returned to the resort i started doing some research and realized that pooking calls are rare but not unheard of Tiger spoke not only to hunt but also to warn other tigers while entering their territory. reinforcing mr pallav's theory as the fully entered territory of two males similar tactic is employed by another small feline called margi 
distributed from the tropical lowlands in Mexico through Central America to Brazil and Paraguay. I also started reading extensively about what different wildlife literatures and case histories say about the encounter between rhino and tiger in terms of supremacy. All of them said the same thing, that while tiger can kill rhino cub fairly regularly, an adult rhino would prevail over tiger and can cause fatal injuries to the predator's body by using its horn. Well, almost always. One research mentioned about an aberration though. Some more call, huh? Huh? It takes a hell lot of skill and cunning to accomplish this. I realized that after all, with my 20 years of safari experience, I still didn't know anything about tigers. With our capacity for music and mathematics, for art and hope, much of Kaziranga shimmered at night and my dead tired body remembered what Auden said about the purpose of our existence in this creation. We must love one another and die. I'm sure Kazi and Ranga's soul would agree or the myth would have dissolved by now. But for the first time, I felt the twin shall meet. These almost aren't working for me anymore. Yes, Mr. Pallab, I must see your Dafoli. <laughs>